Uh, hi, and welcome to the Wild Times podcast. Fuck, dude. I mean, that was terrible, Peter. It was yeah, fucking. Start to it finish, was fine. Was no, you pooped. The, you pooped the, your the pants. The original one was fucking. You fucking pooped it. I mean, let me <laughs> just start it. Sure, sure. Go ahead, poop pants. Wild Times. I showed up to the Zoom meeting sans shirt. I've been working out. Felt good. <laughs> Sounds like a real entertaining show. Wow! Yeah. <laughs> And that's a long end. And Woo! we are back with the Wild Times. <laughs> it is episode number five. I am joined today by Mr. Patrick DeLuca, as always. Good to see you guys, man. And Mr. Ratep. How are you, Peter? You guys have an overabundance of energy. <laughs> I'm out. No, just kidding. <laughs> Go to bed. Hey, how you doing? Ratep here. Yeah. Oh, man. How's your guys' week been? Has it been... How's, how's quarantine week four? Are we on week four? Five, mate. Five, Five. in Whoa. LA. I feel like I've been in for two years. I see you shaved your beard off, weird guy. What the fuck is going on with your face? Oh my goodness. It is one of the worst decisions I've made in <laughs> over a decade. If you haven't shaved your beard in like five years, and it's the age of 30 to 35 or 36, and then you see your face after that long, it's frightening. Every time I pass the mirror, I'm like... <laughs> That's how we feel just looking at you on Zoom right now. That's true. I am not the funny, interesting, or handsome one. When was the last time, Forrest, you saw your face without a beard? Oh, it's, it's been at least three years now. What about you? Okay. Since probably 2003. I mean, a long fucking time, like 16, oh, wow. 17 years. Yeah. Wow. God, we are some bearded guys. My I know. Peter. I've got pics of Pat without a beard, and uh, I'm going to post them on the Wild Times podcast. Yes. com. This is delightful. <laughs> how's your How's your quarantine going? Uh, are you still completely alone, or are you able to, to see some people now? No, I'm good. I'm So I got over my, uh, my short... Um, after coming back from Indonesia, I had to go into complete isolation. But after 10 days of that, I'm allowed to be around family and uh, keep it, you know, I'm, I'm like doing the same thing that everybody else is doing now. So gotcha. hashtag stay inside, except don't. No really. doubt. Yeah. Ugh. You guys, uh, you guys been doing anything to keep yourselves occupied? Pat, I, I know you've been talking about doing Zoom meetings. This seems to be the big new thing these days. I'm sure like probably most of our listeners, you know, I feel like I'm getting invited to like a Zoom hangout pretty much every night. Uh they they can be fun. They're hit or miss though, man. Like all you it takes one bad seed to ruin a Zoom hang. If you do one where you can't get a word in edgewise, like you know, like a 12 person group and everyone's having cocktails and like one person is just dominating, like I'll just X out. I'll bail. Do you Irish exit or do you say goodnight? I sort of like pretend I'm fiddling with my laptop like something's going wrong and then I exit out. <laughs> Technical difficulties. Yeah. That's the uh, Irish goodbye of the future. I know, yeah, seriously. I know. We did a fun one last night. So obviously my rugby team and I are not allowed to get together and train and, you know, play rugby and beat the shit out of people like we like to do on Saturdays. But um, that also means there are no Saturday night social. So last night there were 17 guys on um, on Zoom, all drinking beer, all chugging on Zoom. <laughs> and uh it, I, I actually, so I started the trend. I'll have everyone here know. I showed up to the Zoom meeting sans shirt. I've been working uh, out, felt oh, good. Was like, Goodness. You know, I'm not going to wear a shirt. I, and everybody made fun of me when I signed on because of the 17 guys, I was the only one without a shirt. Three and a half hours later when I signed off, there was only two guys still wearing their shirts. <laughs> Dude, on as, the soon as, <laughs> as soon as you said 17 rugby players, I was like, so... Did anyone have it framed up on their face or just their bare asses or dicks? Right. Most, most... <laughs> <laughs> Three yeah. left with shirts and zero with pants. There yeah. was yeah, there was a lot of like ball sneaking showing and yeah, boy. It, <laughs> of course. It, it was exactly what a rugby zoom sounds like. No, it's when it's good. You got to have contact, man. You got to keep that human contact going or you that's how you'll really go nuts, man. That's right. So I went I went for a pretty awesome hike actually yesterday. Uh most of the trails around Southern California have been closed. Um which is kind of dumb. It's like close the biggest open spaces possible. But uh, there's one that's open. It's called Deep Creek. And oh, my God, dude, it is amazing. I can't believe I didn't know about this place. But I took my uh, five-month-old dog, and uh, there's no stopping people from petting your dog. <laughs> that's right. Um, yeah. <laughs> and so I read up, and it seems like they're saying it's not like a huge concern of like a way to spread the virus is through like dog fur. Yep. 
But uh, it is, man. What are you talking about? The virus can live on surfaces for an extended amount of time. You luckily already had coronavirus, though, so you should be safe. <laughs> I did use that to get out of a responsibility. You're, you're not letting this go, huh, Ritep? Every time it comes up, you're like, Patrick, you had it. Remember, you had it. Listen, I take shit from you guys in every <laughs> podcast. So when there's something I can pounce on, I'm going to grab it and go forever. Well, this is podcast number four. The first three are out. People seem to be loving this, man. Lots of comments, lots of feedback. The numbers are fantastic. Thank you to everyone who's listening. Thank yeah. you, guys. Yeah. Yes. Peter, you told me that we are ranked like in the top 50 for comedy podcasts in in. What, many some, in many countries country that has 35 listeners or something like that uh K- qatar is it qatar it's, yeah <laughs> great cater somewhere somewhere really restrictive we are in the top 50 in all pod top 80 actually in all podcasts in canada do you have a huge canadian following for us i apparently because <laughs> <laughs> i didn't know this so for all of my or is, is canuck a racist term can i say canuck? no that's like no, the, name that's of the, hockey the hockey team, team. <laughs> okay sorry yeah. i i didn't know it sounded weird when i rolled Feel off the tongue mr there, science man. guy all of my canuck followers <laughs> thank you guys you guys are amazing for tuning in and uh if you're gonna send hate mail just remember the other two guys said that uh, canuck was okay um, yep. yeah send totally that to forest at the wild times podcast.com all hate mail <laughs> directed to no you. but it is amazing honestly the fact that we've made it to you know in four podcasts with the with the amount of reviews and you guys all listening in that we are in the top 80 podcast is incredible. So thank you guys very much. Absolutely. Really, that's, that's the goal, man. It's like, you know, I love, I love podcasts and you get addicted to them and it becomes like something you rely on and count on for your, you know, not right now, but commute or your gym time or your 100%. walking the dog. And, uh, you know, with a lot of these podcasts, it's tough. I mean, real, you know, your buddies with Rogan, but like, I love Rogan's podcast, but it's not necessarily interactive and we do want ours to feel like just a big fucking hangout you know yeah yeah uh please continue with the comments send us messages on instagram we'll get into it and i've got one that i want to get into right now do it let's what is it have it mate so it's from a listener claire l and she is dying to know does forrest frost his tips (laughs) (laughs) i was like oh here comes something useful something here comes a good question (laughs) it's about your hair no it is about my hair that is a great question claire l um i'm not really sure what makes it a great question because but because uh, we want to know man uh, yeah the people want to know i did frost my tips once when i was about 14 and you couldn't tell the difference. <laughs> and I think um, the problem is I spend so much time outdoors, and I'm actually relatively fair, even though I'm always sunburnt and tan. And my hair just gets uh, it gets light until I chop it off. I am not above highlights. Don't get me wrong. I would do it, and I would tell you honestly. <laughs> and I say that because I will tell you that when I shave my beard down, there's a gray patch that sometimes I sharpie in because uh, when it gets really short, you can see my gray patch in my beard. <laughs> but I do not frost my tips. <laughs> I do remember a time where I was literally puking my lungs out in Madagascar from some sort of weird bacteria that was going around the crew. And I just looked up through my bleary, tear-filled eyes and saw you sharpieing in a gray spot on your beard. It, was, yep. it really made me feel better. It was a real thing that I've had to do it. I have one. What I don't get is why you had to dye your beard while you were looking for extinct animals in Madagascar. Well, when my executive producer is bent over puking his guts out, I know I have some downtime to fix my overall appearance. And seeing (laughs) as I don't know how to operate hair dye, I have a brown Sharpie (laughs) that does the trick. Because you got to impress this guy here. Yeah, that's what matters. That is what matters. Of course. So what's the plan for today, Forrest? I know you had something in mind you wanted to get into. You know, there is one weird common theme from listeners that have been writing in, sending comments, which they want to ask me about cryptids. Cryptids! Now, guys, I got to be clear about this. I am not a cryptid expert. I'm a biologist. I study real known animals. So your questions about, hey, is Bigfoot out there? Are you going to find him? You're the guy. Hey, what's up with Loch Ness Monster? She's hot. Um, I, <laughs> I don't know if anybody said that, but um, I don't know that much about these animals, but um, I figure we could address some of it right here on the podcast, clear the air, but just understand I'm not a cryptozoologist. Well, luckily we'll I, I am. So I was going to say, Ritep and I, Good. between the hours Good. of 4 and 6 a.m., we are talking cryptids almost <laughs> every week. So. It's true. I'd like to get your, you know, just sort of, because here's the thing. Cryptids all sort of fall into the space of the animal kingdom, right? Whether it's Sasquatch Certainly. or Loch Ness Monster, there's a plausible explanation for what it could be or if it could exist. So what I'd like to do is, Let's create a, a scale of 1 to 10 for us. 
10 okay. being, I think it probably exists to one being like, I, there's no explanation for this. And right. we'll just, we'll throw a few at you. L- the, great. Let's do it. And I'll give you reason why I score them because as someone who understands the animal world, I could tell you how likely or not likely it is that the animal could even exist. Okay, so here's the first one, animal nerd. Uh, one of my <laughs> favorites is called the chupacabra. Ah, yes. I know a little classic. bit about it. Uh, so it, it was first, first sighted in 1995, I believe, in Puerto Rico because there were a lot of goats being killed. And I, this apparently is confirmed. Look, I wasn't there, but in 95... A farmer found eight of his goats that had been killed. Each of them had three chest wounds or whatever, uh, and he claimed that they were drained of blood. And chupacabra has become this thing that is sort of a creature that hops like a kangaroo, has some mangy dog or wolf-like characteristics, and apparently sustains off sucking the blood of livestock. Not just livestock, but my understanding is chupacabra loosely translates to the goat sucker. You know, you eat... You eat rodents your whole life, you suck one goat, all of a sudden you're a goat sucker. <laughs> you can never uh, get rid of it. That's your reputation. You that's it, one you're a goat. goat sucker. Um, but scale of one to ten. Well, here's, let me tell you something interesting about the chupacabra. As you guys both know, and I'm sure a lot of my listeners do, or our listeners do, um, I am obsessed with the thylacine, right? The Tasmanian tiger. It's, uh, it's, my, it's my great white buffalo. It's the animal that I must find. Um, and in doing research in digging through archives and archives, a famous Australian zoologist named M.K. Davis actually found a report that a ship bound for Tasmania um, back, I think, in the 20s or 30s, I'm not positive of the exact date, a ship, sorry, leaving Tasmania bound for the Brooklyn Zoo actually crashed somewhere in the Northeast. Half the animals drowned and the other half escaped. Now, stay with me. That ship had two breeding pairs of thylacine on it, confirmed. So four. Four Tasmanian tigers on board. Four Tasmanian tigers on board the ship (laughs) that crashed along the shore of the Northeast. Now, let's dig into that for a second, Northeastern America, right? Isn't that where you're from, Pat? These could be your family members. (laughs) Northeastern United States, you know, where, um, where the ship crashed where the thylacine escaped because they, they recovered all the animals that died and none of the thylacine were recovered, right? So four thylacine, in theory, escaped from the ship and are running amok in the Northeast. Now, if an elephant escapes in New England, we're going to know about it, right? <laughs> right it's giant, right. it's big, it's cold, it's going to die. Somebody would text somebody else and there would be a picture of it. <laughs> <laughs> but if a thylacine or four thylacine escape in the Northeast, Somewhere that has a lot of livestock, that has um, woods that are very, very similar to Tasmania, that has a climate similar to the southern part of Tasmania. It's not far-fetched to believe that these animals could survive. Maybe not indefinitely, maybe not to the point of establishing a functioning population, but if you think that you're Joe Schmo, Schmo Farmer and you come out one night and this weird striped animal with this giant jaw and this kangaroo-like tail is feeding on your sheep in New England... And then it runs off with these demon glowing red eyes in the night. That's not hard to say that it could be a chupacabra, if you get what I'm saying. Explain the the red eyes for us. Sure. So thylacine, like many um, carnivores, they have the tapetum lucidum, which is a lens in their eye that reflects light when um, a flashlight is shined on them. Crocodiles have this. Um, A lot of animals actually have this eye shine. So, you know, you go out at night, you shine around with your flashlight, and these glowing red eyes are feeding on your sheep. You run over there and the sheep's mutilated and you're a farmer from New England who's never even heard of a thylacine. You could totally start making up, you know, this fantasy creature in your head and turns out eight other farmers in the same area have all had this fantasy creature taken down a sheep. It's the same thing we know Tasmanian tigers used to actually do in Tasmania. It's to me, the, the chupacabra is it's higher up than in the, you know, one to five category. Dude, that's amazing. I mean, to think so this ship was en route from Tasmania in the South Pacific mm-hmm. all the way. It was intended for Brooklyn. Right. We, yep. th- it's not known exactly where it crashed. So they think somewhere in the northeast. But what's the most dangerous patch of water on that route in the Caribbean there? Right. Caribbean right in the Bermuda yeah. Triangle, Bermuda Triangle. Which is, mm-hmm. is not mysterious. It's just a place with a lot of boat traffic and a lot of rogue <laughs> waves and a lot of bad right. weather. 
Who the fuck knows? Maybe it crashed outside of Puerto Rico on one of the reefs there. Totally. Oh my well, so God, what's your dude. what's your final verdict? What what do you give it on a scale from one to ten if it exists or not? I would say the likelihood that there were th- some thylacine running around North America that were misidentified as chupacabra that created the rumor is like as high up as a seven or eight out of ten. Okay, I'm that's seeing, pretty high. I'm it seeing is. in our future forest uh, caparinas. I don't think they drink those in Puerto Rico, but. I just want to do a season three episode of Extinct or Alive, Tasmanian Tiger, Puerto, Puerto Rico. Rico. Yeah. Just sitting on a beach in PR, drink, drinking a Mai Tai, <laughs> looking for yeah. thylacine. We're doing Couple research. Binoculars. <laughs> on your yeah. iPad. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Mitch launches there. the drone. We're good. We'll find <laughs> just, every now and then we just lazily lift up the binoculars, <laughs> scan the beach, and go back to laying down. Let me ask Sounds you like this. a real entertaining show. <laughs> Let's say that I decide to have my wedding in Puerto Rico. We decide to go for a little uh, bro hike the day before the wedding. Just, Naturally. We're like, mm-hmm. Forrest, take us on a nature hike. We'll pick some shrooms. Uh, <laughs> We come across a thylacine. No cameras, no cell phones, anything. You see it. What do you think you would actually do? Would you immediately get an erection? Would you shit your pants? Would you <laughs> Who run would win after in a it? fight? What do you do? Forest or the chubacabra? <laughs> it's such a weird, like, you face that question, right? It's the same thing that, um, oh, I'm blanking on his name now, the Australian naturalist that we met with in uh, Northern Australia. Yeah. We're like, you can't just run out and be like, I saw a thylacine, I saw a thylacine, because everybody goes, well, you're crazy. You yeah. know, you have no proof. So it's like, I, as a scientist, I know that that's what I cannot do, even though that's what I would want to do. Like, I would want to run up to your entire to you and your entire wedding party and everybody and be like, guys, I saw one, I saw one, I saw one. I know what I saw. I'm not crazy. I think I know what Forrest would do. What would I do? He would try to get a sample of the blood, stick it up his rectum. This again. So he could turn into Chubacabra Man. <laughs> that's right. Much like Lion Man. <laughs> Only but with the chupacabra. Peter, blood. to be clear, thylacine's an actual animal. Yeah. Chupacabra <laughs> is not. How the hell did we get on that, man? I've had too many <laughs> drinks. Did we switch topics? Wait, no. I've just been anxiously awaiting my pick for cryptid because now I feel like it's a competition. Let's move on. Skinwalkers. Have you heard of skinwalkers? I don't know what that is. I'm sorry. Oh my God. Where have you been, man? <laughs> These crazy ghouls that definitely exist. Okay. So a 10 already. <laughs> um, sorry, Peter. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they're supposedly a combination of animal and man. Okay. Picture like a wolf that can stand up on two legs, but they also have like crazy, they can, for example, run and keep up with a car on the highway and they take different forms and they can get into your mind and mess with you. Now there's this place called Skinwalker Ranch. It's in Utah. How do you know? Fuck off. Yeah. <laughs> no, go ahead. Why? So I, I, so I, Have you I been just there came from Skinwalker Ranch about a month ago. I was there doing research for, Dude, a, what? Yeah, for a TV show. Yeah, when I went to Utah for a couple of days, that's that's where I was. Um, Forrest, this is actually no really shit. popular. There's actually a, a series coming out on History Channel, I think, like next week, uh, about Skinwalker Ranch. Oh, wow. It's it's sort of like the new uh, Sasquatch. Okay. Like it's very popular out in the sort of internet chat room world. Okay. Um, because... There's a lot of rumors from people around this area that they've seen these sort of wolf-like creatures. It, legitimately, there have been a lot of cattle mutilations in the area. There are now, when wolves I was there, there I didn't. Right? There yeah. are wolves, and I actually saw one in the two days I was there, walking through the snow towards uh, a moose with its calf. Oh, that's cool. Um, but then it heard our uh, Polaris, and the wolf stopped and went off in the other direction gotcha. during the middle of the day. By wow, the way, wow, that's pretty neat. Which was which was yeah. pretty cool. But uh, the the thing with Skinwalker Ranch is that. The, the family that originally owned it, uh, the guy wrote a book about these weird creatures that he would see. Um, and then at some point, the U.S. government uh, bought the property and had sort of an Area 51-like uh, operation there. And the CIA was in charge oh, of it. It was blocked off. If you drove up to the gate, armed people on SUVs would come out and get you the fuck out of there. Hmm. And so I think that really added to the the mystique of this skinwalker cryptid. No, look, it's really fascinating. I mean, we encountered in Zanzibar, you know, the the medicine men there believe that they they could have leopards transform and do their evil bidding from uh, shaman to leopard and back. So yeah. this is a common thing globally. I'm not familiar with skinwalkers. I mean, clearly I'm not spending enough time on the dark web and internet <laughs> chat room. <laughs> Are you saying that I but, am uh, spending too much time there? No, 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 not, not at all. <laughs> barely, barely enough. <laughs> 13 hours a day is bordering on none. Um, 
But no, look, I mean, it's it's really fascinating. For me, the thing that holds weight is is the the key that the U.S. government was involved, right? So as soon as you like start adding the government to it, it's like Area 51. I'm not saying there's Martians walking around it, but there's something going on there or it wouldn't be this top secret base with the government involved, right? So right. same, in my opinion, it's kind of like same thing with Skinwalker Ranch. I'm not necessarily a big conspiracy theorist, but why is the government involved? Like, what's going on there that's sure. bringing them to, to lock yeah. it off? So it's really, really interesting. But what about the cattle mutilations, just biologically? Like, uh, wolves, I would imagine, would be the main predator in the area. Is that something that a wolf would do, just mutilate? I mean, yeah, of course they'd fucking eat some cattle, right? For sure. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. yeah you know, wolves will do it. Uh, coyotes will take uh, fawns. Badgers will take fawns. Bobcats will, uh, Bobcats won't really, but mountain lions will. You know, there's things that can mutilate livestock in North America. What was your thought, Forrest, when we were doing uh, season two of Extinctor Alive? We went in search of the Rocky Mountain Wolf, and we talked to the farmer who had one of his big bull cattle was uh, killed, right? That was really odd, yeah. The fact that it wasn't just like a small calf or, or a heifer or anything like that, but one of the large bulls had been mutilated, I mean, that led me to believe that it was not just a wolf, but possibly a pack of wolves like the Shasta pack that had come back into California. Mm -hmm. You know, we went on to find that, um, you know, it seemed as though there was a population of koi wolves or at least one very large koi wolf. Now, whether that animal did the killing or not, it's impossible to say, isn't it? But it sure seemed like it. That was a fun shoot. I remember we were up in the mountains uh, camping in the snow and, uh, we were just camping at night. I think you were cooking up uh, something. I can't remember. You were cooking something in the fire. Venison. Remember, it was uh, the deer. Oh, it's a wolf right. kill. That's right. <laughs> we yeah. found the kill and started hacking up the the, the venison. You scavenger fucks, you. Yeah, we did, <laughs> dude. But when you did, just did the wolf call. Just you just made a wolf call with your own uh, throat and face. And uh, <laughs> wait, let's hear it. Obviously. Oh boy. Okay. Let's hear let's hear a wolf call. So, okay, let me preface this by just saying that anyone can do this and it does work in places with wolves. Now, while the audio is about to spike, I will give it to you nonetheless. Oh, oh, oh! So he does that. I'm standing there holding a camera. I'm kind of far. I'm holding the wide shot. About five, six seconds later, we hear one coming from the west. Yep. And then they started going. And yep. we heard a and whole bunch of them. Yeah. Mix, yep. Was that a mix, Forrest, or was that coyotes, or were those wolves? Do you remember? I mean, I don't know for sure. It's really okay. hard to say. But there were multiple animals. Resp- I mean, there was one distinct one, but you could hear a few other animals off in the distance that were definitely responding to us. So yeah. I think it was that koi wolf that we caught on the trail camera that was responding sure. back. You, do you guys it, ever... Uh, I mean, I've been doing this since I was a kid with my dog. It was a, And Pat, you got a great dog for this. Do you ever howl with him and try and get him to howl? Of course. It's the cutest thing I've ever seen. <laughs> I, th- I think we should all... What about you, Forrest? Your pup. Your pup's like 14, so I don't know if... He's a grumpy old man, a curmudgeon. Yeah, he's too lazy, but yeah, no, I do, for <laughs> sure. It's, it's super fun. All right, so I'm going to go to, uh, I think, probably the one that interested me the most as a kid. What's when I was that? a kid, I was just like, man, this, this obviously has to exist. It's the Loch Ness Monster. Ooh, interesting. Basically a, so interesting. a modern dinosaur, basically, well, right? What we have is, we have a lake. Uh, it's in Scotland. Mm-hmm. and Lake Loch Ness, which goes up to about 800 feet deep. So it's a pretty right. deep lake. Right. Um, mm. And people for many, many years have said that they've seen this thing kind of come out that looks like a big-ass sea serpent. Well, I'll tell you what I love about it. So like you, that was the one I was the most obsessed with as a kid. I think all, I think everyone can relate to that. As a kid, you like want these fantastic beasts to be real creatures. Um, I think for me, the the reason that it was so, I was just so fascinated by the Loch Ness Monster. One, like you say, it's the, the depth of the lake and the ability for something large to hide in there. But I was also obsessed with dinosaurs. And I one of the theories I believe is that the Loch Ness Monster is a plesiosaur, you know, which is a big aquatic reptilian dinosaur. And um God, it's been a long time since I've even thought of those. But the (laughs) fact, you know, there are, look, crocodiles are living dinosaurs, right? Right, They really are. They haven't changed for hundreds of millions of years in evolution. They are dinosaurs. They really are. They are living dinosaurs. So what's to say that there aren't other living dinosaurs? 
Now, the, the odds of there being a singular one in this lock that's never died, that's pretty skinny, but I like right. the Maybe idea. there's several, dude. Maybe there's several, and they're all different sure. sightings, you know? Right. Could be. Could I've be. seen the pictures. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> of a guy's arm stuffed into pantyhose yeah. sticking up out of the water. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> dude, yeah. It, it, all right, it, so yeah. what's your 1 to 10 on this one? 1 to 10, oh, I'm going to give this like a, like a 2 or 3. That sounds Wait. about right. Wait, yeah. wait. What? So, what did? Uh, I don't think we ever got the uh, the number for the Skinwalker. Oh, the Skinwalkers. Yeah, I'm gonna <laughs> I'm gonna go with ten. zero. Peter. Ten <laughs> zero. This is bullshit. You, you idiot. like you said you at the beginning, the... you are not a cryptid zoologist. I am. Yeah. No. It's obviously he just, he a twelve. In science. <laughs> yeah. He gets yeah, his I'm science not for science from uh, peer-reviewed journals. You get yours from Reddit. <laughs> hey, Reddit That's is true. the largest user sourced comments i don't know anyways uh <laughs> forest forest do you have one that you're into like what's your favorite cryptid yeah. uh, man like i said it, it's really not my field of study but there is one other one that that definitely tickles my fancy um mm -hmm. and i think it's because it tickles my fancy and also annoys the shit out of me because people are always asking me to go find it, and it's just the simple old Bigfoot. Ah, now, yeah. I'll tell you, yeah. it's Bigfoot. Harry and from I'll Harry you, and I'll the Hendersons. That's right. <laughs> I'll tell you why I find Bigfoot somewhat interesting. Again, not plausible, not something I've studied, don't know how to track a Bigfoot, etc. But what's interesting about Bigfoot is the New World has primates, right? We have monkeys in South America. Anywhere that you can think of primates, the larger they are and the higher up they are in the food chain, the smaller their population. And what I mean by that is if you go to the Congo, right, and you see gorillas, mm -hmm. it's not like there's gorillas everywhere, like if you go to Southern Africa and see baboons, right? There's baboons all over the place because they're not very big, they're, they're abundant, there's abundant food. But when you go to the Congo to see gorillas, there's these small troops of these gorillas, right? Well, as you get higher up in the food chain, there's smaller populations, that'll make sense, they require more resources, so what is the step above mm -hmm. the gorilla? Well, maybe the step above the gorilla is the Bigfoot, right? North America's primate is this Bigfoot. But opposed to having several thousand like the gorilla, there's, what if there's only 200 of them, right? Mm -hmm. And North America's primate has this tiny population that for some reason is very, very elusive. It knows how to hide. It knows where to congregate, to reproduce, blah, 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 blah. Yeah. And sightings of this primate in North America is what have could have possibly led to the the name Bigfoot. So that's the only, to me, the only shred of, of kind of scientific grounding that could explain why there is a Bigfoot. So in North essentially America. every other landmass has some sort of primate, except really North, you know, US and Canada, there's none, right? Right. Well, take out Australia as well, because they're, they're their own thing with marsupials. Sure. But yeah, I mean, you've got them all over Africa, all over Asia, all over South America, you know, up into Europe, uh, in, in Asia. Yeah. So everywhere. And America should have primates. You know what I mean? We've got them all the way down to Panama. It's not like the canal stopping them. Right. Uh, right. right. Yeah. So which like, that's, why, yeah. that's right. Super which interesting. we made. Right. So why don't we have primates here in North America? That's the question. Yeah. That's, that's fascinating. That's man. Does Canada have? I mean, so all of North America doesn't have primates then. Like Correct. Canada, Correct. Canada no. too. Okay. Interesting. No, po nope. no, Peter. Polar bears are not primates. <laughs> <laughs> hey, man. I don't have enough sense right now to have a comeback to that. So just eat a dick. All right. How's that? What are you? What are you drinking? Yeah, Peter? I know. Jesus. I went from I went from a nap to my third glass of just Jameson on the rocks. Is that <laughs> bad? And guy. it was four. It was four p.m. on a Sunday. So I was Forrest, up real late got? last night. Yours looks classy, Forrest. What are you sipping oh, on, boy? Mine's delightful. It's uh, one part gin, three parts tonic. I'm thinking of naming it the uh, the Cuba Libre. The Cuba Libre. <laughs> no, it's a gin and tonic. It is. It's tremendous. What about you, Patrick? I am drinking espresso and uh, spiced rum. Wow. Let me tell you. You guys in your, your 6 p.m. coffees. That's a hell of a call. Dude, well, I, when, you, I, when you wake yeah. up at 1, right. it's still morning. <laughs> right. I was going to say, it's lunchtime. Forrest, you know, here's one that I actually think uh, I'm pretty excited about. I sent you this article last week. It's probably my, my favorite cryptid now as an adult because I okay. am giving it a 10 out of 10. I wow. think it exists. <laughs> I tend to base my life in science like you, but I'm really into this one. I want to see what you thought of the article I sent you. It's called The Kraken. The Kraken Rises. Yeah, so... 
Look, as far as the scale, this has got to be the highest up one. Um, get out of here. Get out of town. A kraken is a giant cephalopod, right? Giant squid or octopus. Now, I think... I, I'd like to say 100 years ago we would have straight away said it's fake, but we wouldn't have because the rumors have been around since then. But scientifically speaking, we only discovered that there are jumbo squids, I don't know, 10, 15, maybe 20 years ago now. Um, and, and truly... There are massive squid that, I, like, I don't even know the size of them. You're talking about 30 feet long or longer. And it's not far-fetched to assume that during at some point in time, these giant 30-foot-long squid would come to the surface uh, the same way the Humboldt squid do occasionally and grab onto the side of a boat or flip over someone's canoe or something like that, and a sailor would see it. And that resulted in this mystery of the Kraken. Well, Interesting. So yeah, so I mean, you know, you've seen these depictions, and I think the the legend of the kraken started with the the Vikings, right? They had this, right. these tales of these huge sea creatures with multiple tentacles. There's you know fucking tons of uh, renditions of it in, in uh, Viking art um, of this basically a giant octopus that would come up, grab a ship, and bring it to the bottom, and they would say the kraken took it. Uh, mm-hmm. Sounds like bullshit. Well. Not according to Mark McMenamin, who is a very credible uh, paleontologist. So there's a place in Nevada called Ichthyosaur uh, State Park, and it's basically a dry seabed. Uh, it's yep. in Nevada. Obviously, it's desert now, but it used to be uh, the ocean floor, essentially. And what he discovered in Ichthyosaur uh, State Park is an, a strange arrangement of bones of this very large dinosaur called the Ichthyosaur. And hmm. they're arranged in this very specific pattern. It's a pattern that we see in present day uh, when an octopus eats a fish. So octopus tend to live in these little, they call them, I think, covens or covens. Mm -hmm. Coven, yeah. Um, Yeah. They live in these little dens and they hang out there and they may live their whole life there. But when an octopus eats a fish, they play with the bones. They make art Mm -hmm. out of the bones, essentially. And these shells and all kinds of things. They they make, they decorate their lawn, essentially. They're the best. They're the best. (laughs) I know. They are cool as shit and we talk about them a lot, but... (laughs) <laughs> what he found was a, a, evidence of the same pattern that modern-day octopus tend to arrange the bones of, of the fish they eat, but of a bunch of ichthyosaurs, which are a fucking huge right. fucking dinosaur. Right, right, right. right. So, Wait, so that's so the with, evidence that the kraken existed because it arranged these giant bones in some sort of well, organized what's, what's pattern? what's your take on it, Forrest? Poke, poke holes in the theory that this must have been a kraken. Yeah, well, look, I I don't think it's far-fetched to think that at some point in evolutionary time, we had absolutely giant cephalopods that were living in giant caves on the seafloor and arranging bones and shells the way that modern-day cephalopods do. So, you know, is it a kraken versus some kind of dinosaur octopus that we don't know? (laughs) Sure, why not? It's it's the same thing. I mean, it's all the same thing, isn't it? It doesn't mean that it exists today, but there's no doubt in my mind that at some point something like that did exist. If you had a gun to your head, and then unfortunately I have to tell you that everyone you know and love also has gun to, guns to their heads at the same moment. Stakes. <laughs> Is there some sort of giant sea creature somewhere in the world that we haven't discovered yet that is the type of thing of like a kraken or a Loch Ness monster or a remnant dinosaur? Yes or no? 100% yes. I love it! Yeah, <laughs> leaves us some mystery out there in the universe. Aliens and giant sea creatures, man. You said earlier, you know, that I, I'm, I'm up at four or five every morning texting you. That's because I've been up for several hours reading about conspiracy theories, aliens and deep sea creatures that we have yet to discover. It's the it's magic of being an adult, man. Yeah, exactly. It's a real thing, guys. We know more. I mean, everyone drops the same dumbass statistic, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to rehash it. We know more about the surface of the moon than we do about the deep sea. All right. Well, guys, as um, tonight's topics uh, seem to have gone askew, I figure in the spirit of cryptids, we will do our battle royale. Oh, yeah! Ow! Ow! <laughs> so, here's what I'm thinking. For tonight's battle royale, we are going to take real-life characteristics of animals or cryptids, up to you. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. our your goal, gentlemen, is to create 
the most famous cryptid of all time. Obviously, we know Bigfoot <laughs> is the most famous. Everybody knows Bigfoot. All right. Not whatever thing you came up with, Peter. <laughs> skin crawlers. Skin walkers, mate. Sorry. Sorry. Skin walkers. Um, so let's combine three elements of three known animals or cryptids to create the most famous new cryptid in history. Take us away, Patrick. All right. So the goal is to make this cryptid more famous than Bigfoot. Correct. Okay. All right. Well, I've and I've got to take elements from other cryptids and animals. Um, all right. So what I'm going to do this seems like a little fucked up because I'm definitely going to win. Oh and boy! I would say if anyone comments and votes for anyone else, they're they're cheating or lying. Wow. De- definitely uh, wrong. I'm going to start with the the full body and and appearance and face and fur. The whole just head to toe. My first characteristic is just the full body and head and face of Bigfoot. Dude, that. Okay. <laughs> Right. Nonsense. It's just ridiculous. <laughs> the most common of so, all cryptids that already exists. Sure. So I'm going to start with this this thing that looks like Bigfoot from head to toe. <laughs> then what I'm going to do, so I'm going to take a characteristic from a real animal, uh, a human, a specific human. I'm going to give it the cooking ability of Bobby Flay. <laughs> Wait a minute. So, First of all, I've already so, got a problem with this animal. So it's, yeah, no, no. Yeah, so it's a so chef. far you've created Guy Fieri. So <laughs> please continue. <laughs> it's a chef, and it's a really good chef. All right. No. So, he but has frosted tips. <laughs> yes, he does. He sure does. He also probably denies it on his podcast. Next <laughs> thing will be, speaking of frosted tips, <laughs> I'm going to give him the speaking voice and every man personality, but very elevated, of Ryan Seacrest. Wow. And this is so, quite a creature. So, <laughs> so what I have is I have a Sasquatch cooking show host <laughs> that is all the charisma of Ryan Seacrest, all the ability of Bobby Flay, yeah. but he's a Sasquatch. Okay. He is going to have his own show on the Food Network and be the most famous cryptid in the history. So so basically wow. there's no rules whatsoever. We can just combine anything that exists <laughs> anywhere in the world or not. Or Are anyway. you stupid? Are humans animals? Are you, you're, you're mixing Bigfoot with an actual animal with a personality. I'm just saying. I thought we were like making animals that were supposed it's, to be the most noticeable <laughs> cryptid. <laughs> I have mean, your own take on it, idiot. That's why yeah. I asked. That's all I'm saying. Bobby Flay Bigfoot is pretty notable. <laughs> <laughs> Do it, Peter. Yeah. All right, I'm up next. So, I mean, I'm, t- I'm obviously taking a more logical approach to this. That's insane. Um, <laughs> so, first of all, I want my animal, be- my animal to be noticeable, right? So, I'm going to have the loudest animal on Earth as part of my concoction of cryptid. It will make the noise of a blue whale, which uh, can Good. can make a noise that is the loudest uh, noise on Earth. It will so, also. So far, we just have audio, no exactly. visual of what the creature looks <laughs> yeah. like. By the way, I could leave you... it at that, and it would you everybody would know this thing is just making noise. It doesn't exist. It's making this loud. That noise. would be creepy if you were just up in the mountains and you just heard like a. Exactly. But it was like exactly. three hundred decibels. A, a whale noise in open air. <laughs> <laughs> Terrifying. Okay. So, Continue. All right. All right. It's also going to have the body and size of this whale. It's one of the biggest animals. Now, you would think that this thing just a whale. In, in its form it's currently, just, if it was just laying like there, if it was just laying there, it wouldn't be very noticeable. But it would be noticeable if you put bat wings on it. Huge oh! bat wings. Dude, Huge that's bat this wings. is your best battle royale yet. That's right. That's it's right. It's a flying blue whale. It's a, it's a blue whale with that. <laughs> that is... I still have one more characteristic left. That's right? true. Wow. Yes. I mean, this is very. This is famous. If I saw a blue whale flapping overhead, I would <laughs> making be making that uh, noise. Yeah. Making oh. that noise. It always comes back to bats with you. Okay. Since I mean, Pat said that <laughs> his is going to be a Bigfoot. I guess we're going into the land of fantasy. I could stick with just regular characteristics, but I'm not going to. Because my animal can breathe fire, ladies and gentlemen. It can breathe but, fire like a dragon. Oh, so that's fuck. my animal. That's good. That's right. It's good. Deal with it. <laughs> okay. So do you, mm, is that going to be more famous than Dude, the person you, you who's are, on your TV you are at a every loss day? For words. You're at a loss for words. Yes, it'll be flying. It's that's, not like there's just one of these. There's well, a whole well, let's, species Let's be of clear them. for a second here. 
uh, Peter's Creature will probably have its own YouTube channel that has 30 million followers, and Food Network gets about six viewers per month now. So it is it is basic <laughs> Looks cable. Like we're never getting picked up by them on the Wild Times podcast. Yeah. Wow, we all took yeah. this an extremely different direction. Uh, you guys have zero chance of winning. I'm just going to put that out there. So to be honest, see what the I'm biologist feeling, has. For the first time, I'm feeling uh, in the Battle Royale game, yes. I'm feeling extremely intimidated by both of your creatures, by, by Patrick's <laughs> and personality and charm and yours and just girth, Peter. Uh, yeah, you just went And huge. noticeability. Yeah, noticeability. <laughs> I, I thought, see, to me, I was like, most famous cryptid creature. It's got to be the most terrifying, the thing that just installs fear into everybody that glimpses it. So I went with the general physique of a werewolf. So big, scary wolf, you know, okay. very standard. I know we're nodding our heads, but stay with me now. Sure, sure. He, Peter started with he, a screech, yeah, he, he, so he, you're already ahead <laughs> of him. <laughs> That's Genius, true. by the way. Genius! This werewolf <laughs> happens to be covered in the erect quills of a porcupine. Oh, good. <laughs> yeah, good. so just real hunched up, spiky werewolf. And it looks like ahead. you with your shirt off already, basically. <laughs> <laughs> but now, replace its head. Now, you might think a wolf's head is the scariest thing in the world until you've mm -hmm. seen a giant alligator snapping turtle's <laughs> yeah. head. So oh, God. An alligator Dude. snapping turtle's head on top of a bipedal werewolf covered in porcupine spines. Dude, that is scary. But how is he going to get noticed? What's he going to do? Well, he doesn't have a cooking show and he doesn't fly and breathe fire. Exactly. So I don't know that I'm winning this one. It's a very, very <laughs> subpar biologist type answer. It's OK, because, yeah. you know, normally you're the you're the best concoctor of animals. But in this case, in fantasy this is not land. Good. This is not good. But I will tell you this. If you like our Battle Royale, go to iTunes and leave us a review. Tell us which your favorite creature is. Leave us a five-star review. And uh, this week, we will pick a winner. And that winner will win some of the most comfortable shorts that exist in the world. They're called Fox and... What are they made out of? They, I don't know. I'm not a shorts maker. <laughs> or a terrifying <laughs> animal maker. They are athletic... Athleisure, athletic wear that's leisurely. Nice. Athleisure um, is very popular, right? Everyone's talking about athleisure right now. Yeah, it's big. And, and these these are shorts from Fox and Robin. You're gonna win three pairs. Whoa! They Whoa. have built-in compression shorts if uh, if you want to work out in them, or you can just get standard workout shorts. They're really comfy. They're for men and women. So go ahead, leave us a review on iTunes. Pick one of our three creatures for the battle royale and be entered into win. A couple pairs of Fox and Robin. Speaking of which, I think it's time to read the contest winner of our first contest. Wow, yeah! Yeah, you. baby. Um, <laughs> yeah, so we what we basically did was we went through all the reviews. We read them. They're all hilarious. We assigned each a number, randomly picked a number, and 27 came up. And Forrest, I'm going to let you read the review from James Harrison Waldrop. Absolutely, Peter. So James Harrison Waldrop, who left us a review on April 10th, review title Battle Royale. Oh, yeah, baby. <sighs> what does it like say? What does this? it say? <laughs> <laughs> he said, the giraffe great white shark hybrid would clearly annihilate all of the other opponents with its fearsome neck swings. Also loving the podcast so far? Keep it up. Congratulations, James Harrison. Although you have no taste in mythical beasts, you do have great taste in clothing because you will be sporting a hundred dollars to KUHL cool outdoor clothing. Fantastic. Great job, James. To be clear, though, that doesn't mean that the animal won. That just means that he was randomly selected. The Correct. animal that won, in my opinion, is the one that got the most votes. And if I'm not mistaken, I do believe that the bat owl creature with the needlepoint tail had at least two. Okay, two well, people that's vote. interesting because uh, <laughs> one of our reviews was from user username needlepoint sharp. <laughs> my animal is famous. And he said, "I've listened to all three episodes multiple times. All caps. I love this podcast. P.S. Retep gets my sympathy vote." That poor boy. <laughs> Dude, what does he mean by that? I think that, uh, just, you know, just, uh, you know, you're not very smart. Now, nah, this is BS. <laughs> Forrest, what about you? Do you have any reviews that you really, uh, that really caught your attention? Oh, well, I mean, for me, the, uh, the one that pops up with the title Slow Pandog Reigns Supreme from L. Smith 105 is a, uh, of course. a real gem. 
Couldn't have it guessed that. It might be one that I screenshotted and added to my camera roll. Just for <laughs> you hung it up on your wall in your bedroom. What's it say, <laughs> mate? Uh, L Smith 105 said, "Great podcast. Can't wait for more episodes." Also, I gotta say that the slow pan dog sounds like the ultimate quarantine buddy, and boy, he's right. <laughs> Dude, I will say <laughs> that uh, you smashed it with the cute quarantine animal buddy contest. <laughs> I was very happy about that. As soon as you went slow, <laughs> Loris, you just, you had it. You yeah, had that, it was, that was a game changer. My favorite review, Forrest, was this one by Give Blood, Play Rugby. Sounds like a, I don't know, maybe, could that be one of your buddies, Forrest? Yeah. <laughs> could be. Maybe. A five-star review <laughs> entitled, Seems So Hateable. <laughs> Man, that Forrest Galante guy really seems so hateable. Just has one of those dumb faces where you think to yourself, <laughs> Man. I really don't like this guy, but wouldn't you know it? He's actually a real treat. Overall, fantastic podcast, fun and informative to say the least. Uh, Hell, I'd leave my wife for this guy. Uh, The last part was obviously bullshit. First part, all accurate and correct. Thank you. Give blood, play rugby. Keep leaving those reviews. I don't know. I like that. You know, look, hey, give blood, play rugby. Maybe message me on the D- on the down low. Like, if you'd leave your wife for me, let's let's get together. Let's talk. Let's see what happens. Hopefully, it's a dude. Yeah. <laughs> Slide into my DMs, guy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and if you are uh, enjoying the podcast, please continue to leave us comments. Shit. Yeah. There's a raffle every week, yeah. and uh, we're very lucky that Forrest has some awesome sponsors, and yeah, uh, he's willing to share the wealth instead of hoarding. Like he usually does. Yeah. James Harrison Waldrop. Hit us up at contact at the wild times podcast.com and we'll get you sorted out, mate. All right. Speaking of cryptids, Forrest, I saw a cryptid that was quite literally caught on camera this week. What? Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. So I would describe it as a squirrel. Okay. And then it's been wrapped in what's obviously the, the very large scrotum of an elephant. <laughs> <laughs> and then it's what got, the uh, hell are you talking about? Peter's favorite characteristic of anything in the world, uh, bat wings. Oh, the monster bat. Peter, did you see that? The monster bat? Yeah, yeah. I, now I know what you're talking about. It's kind of flopping around on the it ground. It popped up today. What is that fucking thing? Yeah, I've been getting tagged by... It's totally viral. I've had a, a couple hundred people tag me in that post today. Um, and it's kind of... It's, it's a weird one, right? It's like a catch-22, and I'll tell you why. Because the video you're seeing is of an animal being tortured. And that sucks. I mean, it really does. It's a bummer. But that animal, and this is what people need to realize, is a Kalugo. And a Kalugo is a fucking super cool animal. Like, it's this... Kalugo? Kalugo, yeah. It's this amazing arboreal gliding mammal from the forests of Southeast Asia. It's a primate, um, meaning it's related to monkeys, that have these thin Mm. membranes between their legs... Um, that allows them to glide from tree to tree. And they've got these huge eyes and these amazing faces. That one in the video is tied on with some string to a stick, and that's why it's, like, flopping around like that. But these Mm. animals are actually really, really cool. They live in the forests of Southeast Asia. They're all over Indonesia, Malaysia, Borneo. Um, They have webbed hands and feet, kind of like, you know, like a frog does. And then these these thin membranes with their arms that they use to glide. What Patrick referred to as the nutsack of a larger animal. That's right. Exactly (laughs) right. And I can totally see that because if you look at a Kalugo when they're stretched out, there's some pictures of them flying from tree to tree. And I shouldn't say flying because other scientists will ridicule me. (laughs) They're gliding, not flying. (laughs) Yeah, totally. I will. Um, but if you look up there, they're like, it's like, it's like if you hold your nut skin up to a flashlight. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Wait a minute. Are you insinuating that all three of us have undeniably held our nut sacks up to flashlights at some point? I'm going to go out on a limb here and say every boy, some point in their life between ages nine and 13, took a flashlight, held their nut sack up. No, to it, and there took a was one kid in my neighborhood who they couldn't afford a flashlight. So, <laughs> okay. Let me ask you a question. <laughs> I need the scientist's perspective on this. I need actual scientific uh, feedback on this. Shoot. Now, I've heard heard that nutsack skin is the same as elbow skin legitimately. Like, it really is the exact same type of skin. Is that true, scientist guy? (laughs) I am the wrong person to ask this (laughs) up. I have no idea. Of course, you must be a dermatologist, right? Yeah, I am am stumped, Peter. I'm sorry. See, I know what people are doing right now is they're Googling Kalugu, Kalogu. And uh, they're, they want to see what this yep. animal looks like. Just skip the step. Go to the wildtimespodcast.com. 
We're nope. going to post uh, some pictures of this insane animal. Uh, not the torture video, obviously, but uh, yeah, you don't need to Google it. Just just go to the wildtimespodcast.com for us. This is, I mean, scientifically, this is the weirdest animal on the planet, right? It's stranger than fiction. I mean, it's a bizarre animal. I'm going to do a video on it explaining it for people because I've been tagged so many times in it. People are going nuts about it. I'm going to explain it, and I want to show some beautiful images of this creature. I mean, they're amazing, and we will be able to find that on the wildtimespodcast.com, all our social pages, my social pages, etc. Hell yeah! Where's this thing from, by the way? So this animal occurs in Southeast Asia, um, and it lives in the treetops. They are truly nocturnal, so they just come out at night. That's why they have those huge eyes. They use those to see at night, glide from tree to tree. Just Do super cool. Do you mean to tell me, Forrest, that this is not a situation where a squirrel mated with a bat and then that <laughs> offspring was then wrapped in the, the nutsack of an elephant? I would call you a fucking liar, <laughs> yeah, no, sir. And, and, like, scientifically speaking, you're 100% accurate. That's how this animal came <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So Forrest got a question, one of the comments on the, uh, the old iTunes comments from user... <laughs> Slinky Jim. Oh boy, nice. Yeah, I don't, I don't know if he's a, a white rapper or uh, <laughs> what Slinky Jim's got going on, but uh, his question is this: Apparently, quarantine is helping uh, a lot of wild animal populations. So he wants to know, Forrest, your opinion of if there's one extinct species that you think may come back or be exposed as a result of quarantine, what would it be and why? Ooh, good question. I mean, I think my, my immediate answer, it's always the same with what animal would you find is the thylacine. But let's take that out of the equation for the Yeah, the I can't. Too yeah. easy, too easy. Too easy. I think um, with everything that's going on globally, we're seeing a massive reduction in pollution. And I don't just mean like plastic in the ocean. I mean light pollution, noise pollution, like human impact in general. And one group of animals that is super sensitive to that, that we are seeing um, a comeback in very, very quickly is amphibians. So frogs breathe through their skin, right? They, that's a dumb way of thinking of it, but they need those pores in their skin to be healthy. So when our waterways are polluted, frogs, um, newts, salamanders, tadpoles, they are all dying very, very quickly. And as we're seeing waterways clear up and things kind of return to how they should be, or at least start to mend during this quarantine, we are seeing amphibian populations spike back up. Now, amphibians, there are tons of species that are lost to science, that have been described once or twice or been gone for 100 years. And I think, here's your answer, Slinky, I think that if I could find the golden toad in Costa Rica or Panama as a result of coronavirus, even though it's just a small yellow frog, I think that would be such a important, significant discovery to show how a little bit of human restraint can make a huge ecological impact. What's so special about the golden toad? Why, why that one? Well, the golden toad, I mean, one, it's a little bit of a poster child of animals that we've lost because we knew we were losing it um, and we still continue to lose it. You know, we watched it get driven to extinction through chytrid fungus, which is this fungus that is attacking amphibians. But it's, it's just this incredible, I mean, if you go Google it, you will see it is the most golden colored animal likely in existence. I mean, absolutely stunning. It's a true toad, meaning even though it looks a bit like a frog, it's an actual toad. Like as you and I know what a toad is that hops around with its big warty skin. Yeah. It's this bright golden colored toad. Um, and it, it occurred in this, it was very, very abundant, which is amazing. And it was in this high altitude region that was only like four square miles um, in Monteverde, Costa Rica, like I said, in, in Costa Rica, or I have these clues to this thing in Panama, but I won't go into that right now. Um, so this, this, this amazing golden colored toad existed in this tiny four square mile range in this high altitude in Panama and nowhere else in the world. And we watched it dwindle and disappear as a result of human impact. And I feel like if we could just find that animal show, it's like, it's like finding gold, you know, it's, 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 it's creature gold and show it to the world and be like, look what happens when we stay indoors. Yeah. Like, it would be pretty significant. All right. So what about the Yangtze river dolphin, the Baji? It's a species that you and I have talked about a bunch of times for extinct or alive. Yeah. Extinct pretty much due to just too many people being out and about, too much uh, traffic on the river, or too much pollution. Exactly right. Yeah, so the Baji, um, incredible, beautiful freshwater dolphin that lived in the Yangtze River 
Um, and unfortunately, the Yangtze River flows out literally in downtown Shanghai, right? So if you want to talk about a, a river, a watershed that's being impacted by people, it's in one of the biggest cities, you know, in the world, frankly. And um, yeah, yeah. that, you know, that there's a bunch of damming along that river. There's a ton of pollution in that river. In fact, short story, if any Chinese uh, Chinese nationals are listening, Patrick and I tried to do an episode on this animal because I actually believe there's a chance there's still some up in the headwaters way up above Shanghai. And when we sent in our application to the Chinese government to say that we wanted to talk about it, they asked us, well, what are you going to say? And we said, well, pollution led to this animal's extinction. They said, nope, and denied our permits to come and film there. Um, I, I literally think the official letter from the government just said, nope. Yeah. <laughs> no, yeah. And so, you know, communist government didn't want us to admit that there was extinction due to pollution there. But wow. with regards to that animal. What, thanks, China. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> um, which sucks. But <laughs> I think that animal could still exist. And I think with what we're seeing with the reduction in people worldwide, who knows if one could come out of uh, hiding? In 2014, there was... Um, a guy who reported sightings of one and a buddy of mine is actually a flight attendant. And he was telling me that, you know, he was on one of the last flights either in or out of Shanghai. I don't remember. And he was saying it's airy because in China they're doing actual lock-ins, right? Where they're walking around like <laughs> bolting people's doors shut. And he was saying, it's just a ghost town. Shanghai has no cars on the road. No people. It's not like going to LA where like, you know, there's still people walking around and getting to go food. Like yeah, this right. was, this was just a ghost town. So imagine if that remained for a couple months or even just enough time for the Baji, this blind pink river dolphin, to go, oh, there's no boats up ahead. There's no construction going on in Shanghai. Nobody's throwing, you know, garbage in the river. Maybe I can relax and like go swim freely for a bit and breathe a little bit. And that led to the rediscovery of the species and ultimately saving it. That would be unbelievable. We talked about the uh, fake photos and videos people are posting, uh, like the dolphins in the Venice canals and stuff like that. Yep. But I, I actually think that this could legitimately happen. Absolutely, it could. I mean, I believe... So here's the thing about why this makes more sense, right? The golden toad, you're talking about a toad, right? Frog brain. Like, they're not they're not geniuses. Right. <laughs> um, you know, they succumb to pollution and things like that very, very easily. A cetacean... A dolphin is not like that. These are incredibly intelligent and adaptable animals, right? With intelligence comes adaptability, meaning, sure, could we wipe them out? Absolutely, we're capable of it. But we weren't in an active hunting strategy to kill these animals the way that we've wiped out many other animals that have gone extinct. Instead, we damn the rivers, and I don't mean we, the three of us and the listeners, but human <laughs> beings damn the rivers and threw garbage in them. These animals could have adapted to that, right? They could have changed their habitat. They could have gone further up the river or into estuaries or something like that to avoid all of this noise and avoid all of the damming and pollution. And if they've been able to hang on hidden and in isolation in a very, very large river system, then maybe they could reappear. And that would be absolutely incredible. Yeah. So these dolphins are, in fact, as smart as regular saltwater dolphins because they're dolphins are considered to be like the third smartest mammal mm -hmm. or it's a mammal, yep. right? Yep. <laughs> Scientist yes. guy. Yes. So these yeah. guys are just as smart as their brothers that are swimming around in the Pacific. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, I don't know where the the Baji ranks compared to all other cetaceans, but it's just known that they have, you know, huge brains. All cetaceans do. All yeah. all whales and dolphins, and these are no exception. And like I said, just being having a big brain means you're smart, and being smart means you're adaptable. Well, it seems obvious to me that they originally left the ocean and went into the river to get away from the kraken that were after. <laughs> That's right, of course. It's perhaps a more mythical looking animal than the kraken itself. Those fucking kraken. So a lot of people are asking, hey, guys, we count on you. We need you for our dog walks, our commute, even though we're not really going anywhere, we're just driving around. <laughs> when, what's the deal? When are the podcasts coming out? Yep. So we want to address that every Monday. Is the answer. So yeah, moving forward, definitely every Monday. We may start doing two a week, uh, Mondays and Thursdays. We'll let you know. But uh, right now, every Monday, count on a new podcast. Starting now, this time, from here out, every Monday. Uh, and we're going to be getting into all sorts of interesting new content. 
never before seen footage stuff of Forrest, you know. So check out the wildtimespodcast.com. What else, guys? The Instagram, the Twitter, all all the places. Yeah, we're going to hit the social channels and um, you know, we're going to we're going to have some fun. We're going to have some more guests on the show coming up. Um, Patrick and Peter have dug up a few more friends of mine from long time mm-hmm. past, a couple colleagues that we've worked with in the field. And um, guys, a little secret here. We're, uh, we're thinking of starting to film them. We're thinking of giving you some video content. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I won't have so, my video turned on. There will be no camera on me until my beard grows grow back. that beard out, please. Yeah. It is really <laughs> It's ah, unfair to the viewer. It's just not nice. <laughs> Wait, all right, quick question. So I have an idea of what I think my face looks like without a beard. What object would you compare my face to? Potato. Yeah, it's like if a potato had didn't have the skin on it. Like, it lost all <laughs> coloration. What about this double chin here? Yeah, it just looks like a shit-ass potato that y- y- it was peeled and then just sort of boiled and then left outside in the sun for several <laughs> like a, days. Like a dirty, peeled potato. I like that. That's what I love about you, too. It's like the store was out <laughs> of potatoes, so you stopped by the garbage dump and just sort of rooted around in, in other people's trash and found the worst potato you'd ever seen. Just a hideous Yeah, I guess I brought this tuber. upon myself. All right. It's kind of okay. like a face where they took all the remaining parts in the excess bin and were like, yeah, just slap these together. This will make That's a enough. face. It Jesus looks like Christ. garbage all right. disposal and the glob Fuck off. out. Love you guys. <laughs> Excited for what's to come. Love you guys. Wild times. Peter, you're ugly. Very much so. Except for you, Pat. Good night. Wild times. Oh, oh, oh!